Good evening, and again I bring you greetings in the precious name of Christ Jesus my Lord, and I do count it a privilege to seek to honor that name, to exalt Him in the things that are to transpire, and whatever circumstances that it might be. We do uh, endeavor to acknowledge that our God is one, yet we worship Him in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, each manifesting themselves in such a way as that we understand salvation as thus. God the Father decreed it, God the Son procured it, God the Holy Spirit applied it, and how we rejoice in this so great salvation. One God, three persons, all glorious, all beautiful, all powerful, omnipresent, and in every way to be praised and to be looked upon with awe in the consideration of the majesty that is his alone. So we thank God for that privilege that we have to seek to honor him, and this we will endeavor to do. And it seems for the time being we're going to continue in this manner as far as our Wednesday evening services are concerned, and we may go on this way for some time. We'll see what uh, the leadership of the Lord is, and it is no problem to us to follow the guidelines and to do that which would honor God as well. It'd be a different situation if indeed churches were being closed while thing, other things were not. But the fact is, this is a public health concern, and it involves all. So we just simply look to the guidance of the Scripture, and that is we're to respect our leaders, to honor them, and to endeavor to be governed thereby, knowing that they are the appointments of God. So I do pray that you will maintain contact with each other. This is the thing that we miss as far as fellowship is concerned, and that is not being able to have that personal one-on-one -on -one contact or one-on-several contact, this matter of coming together in fellowship around the Word of God. What a delightful thing it is and how much we have appreciated now that we're not able to do it in the manner that we would like. And so, nevertheless, to come together around the Word of God, and, and I do pray that you will follow me as I endeavor to minister to you in this fashion, and that, but likewise, that you would maintain contact one with another. And while we can't do so so much physically, although we were able to meet, several of us, not all, but several of us were able to meet on this past Sunday with the uh, maintaining the spread and uh, keeping ourselves distanced from each other, but still able to be in the building together and to worship together in that sense. And I would urge you also to continue and bring prayer requests and uh, let me know, and I'm able to take those things and send them on out, contact others with them. And so in this way, we'll still endeavor to serve the Lord. I'm inviting your attention this evening to the book of Jude, the little one-chapter book just before the book of Revelation. And there we will look. And one of the burdens that I have felt during this period of time is that of maintaining our identity as a body, but at the same time being individually uh, aware of the matters of faith, of love, of honoring God, of doing all of these things. And so under many circumstances, we do that in a group context. Groups are made up of people, individuals. And even though there can be a group mindset or a group think as terms <clears throat> are often applied, but the fact is we are all individuals drawn together by one common aim and one common possession, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. 
He is mine and I am his. And thus we can say that we are his and he is ours. When he would teach us to pray, he would say, Our Father, which art in heaven. So just before I read the text, let's look to him in a word of prayer. Almighty God, my gracious Heavenly Father, I do thank you and praise you for the privilege of opening your word, of being able to look therein, desiring that words of life that would redound to your honor and glory would spring forth from those pages into our hearts, enlivened by he the Holy Spirit, illuminated by he the Holy Spirit, empowered in us by he the Holy Spirit, that Christ might be exalted and thereby God be glorified. I do thank you for this privilege and I ask, O Lord, your guidance upon us. I especially pray for our nation this evening. Pray, O Lord, that you would turn them unto thee. While we pray for relief from the virus, Lord, we pray for mercy that revival might come to our people, that this might be used to draw attention to their own weakness, that they might understand the need for power such as exists only with you. So guide us, O Lord, I pray just now, and I ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Looking then toward the end of this little chapter, although the words at the beginning certainly have a bearing on the things that are contained here. But I want to begin at verse 17 and read these words. But, beloved, remember you the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, that's of pertaining to just the flesh, period, having not the Spirit. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And if some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. And may God bless the reading of his word. As I come to this passage, there's some background here in that this has always been something that was suggested to me many years ago in reading a devotional commentary by, I um, uh, can't think of the man's name now, but I think it was James Lee. But in any event, it was called Handfuls on Purpose. And there were many just beautiful little outlines there, and they were very helpful to this preacher in early years. And the fact is that I remember very clearly in an outline that dealt with the book of Jude, and it focused on the word kept. And it dealt with everything that from the the uh, keeping of the faith and of maintaining that way as far as those things are concerned um, as we look at the first part of the chapter Jude the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved that word preserved means nothing less than kept and there were other things concerning those who kept not their first estate but in particular, my attention was drawn to this latter section. And the thought came to my mind several days ago to deal with this matter under the heading of keeping and kept. And in this particular thought, though, that we're coming down here in this way is just simply the thought of, but ye beloved. 
and a distinction being made there from some of the awful things that were discussed and described in the major portion of the book here because there were those who the angels who kept not their first estate those that were crept in unawares they were re trying to undermine the faith and that's why even early on the exhortation of jude was that you earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints and that we also remember that the the common possession in that faith is salvation, the common salvation, as he said it. And that doesn't mean the ordinary run-of-the-mill thoughts that many would set before us today. But this is that deeply experienced, understood new life in the Lord Jesus Christ, whereby we have been made new creations, whereby we are enabled to come unto him repenting and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ to the saving of our souls. This thoughts concerning this passage and the book of Jude in particular also reminded me, and I knew it had been some years, and I'm thinking, you know, a few years ago, I did a prayer meeting series from just this last portion of this little epistle of Jude. And there it is. It's, it consists of 25 verses, but oh, it is so full of exhortation, of doctrinal truth, of those things that are essential to us in the way of encouragement in this present world. And so that thought naturally led me to start to do a little looking well, my few years uh, tend to uh, be a very inaccurate measure because I did find out that, yes, I had done a series that consisted of seven messages and that it was done in 2010. So here it is nearly 10 years ago that I had done this study. It doesn't mean that's the last time I looked at Jude, but here it was concentrated. It was directed at something that I feel is very appropriate for this time, and therefore I will endeavor to make application. Now, what I don't think that I can do at this point, other than make a just a very brief reference to what all of these messages were, what they consisted of, but it may be that uh, in, in so doing, I'll reach across those things, but it may be that I may deal with essentially one or two, and but we're trying to combine this in a limited amount of time, and so it may be that you'll be hearing from this for a few weeks to come. So we're seeking the Lord's leadership and ask you to pray concerning this, that in all of it, we might have our, our hearts built up, as it were. And this is the thought which begins. If you look at this passage of Scripture, and here we find the ubiquitous but. You say, what's a ubiquitous but? What does ubiquitous mean? Well, it's just a term. It means that it's everywhere. It's all over the place. It's there in the scriptures, so many places in the Word of God. And I've made this reference so many times that I almost apologize for doing it. But I read this back four or five years ago, and I just thought it was just a precious devotional thought dealing with the word but in the scripture. Now, I heard a dear brother speaking the other day, uh, Brother Dale Wallace, and he was talking about uh, the um, motor motorboat believers. These are the ones when you present them with some of the strong truths of the Word of God, like the doctrine of election, the sovereignty of God. You begin to preach those things, and even though you preach them with the tenderness, that the first thing they say is but. And then it's but, 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 but. And so I thought that was a very appropriate thing. There are also the, the I thought, I've often thought, of the billy goat believer. You hit him with a precious truth. You hit him with something that should be of importance to him. 
usually concerning the sovereignty of God and his ability to do as he wills because they want to champion the will of men. And there is no doubt God has given man a free will. You say, oh, preacher, I never thought I'd hear you say that. It's free within the confines of their own nature. And a sinner cannot act freely outside of his own sinful nature. It takes a new nature to act freely in the realm of the grace of God. And when that is done, there is no conflict with the sovereignty of God and with his will and purpose. But as we would carry on with that thought of but, bear this in mind that usually when the word but appears, we can look to the left and we look to the right. On the left side is some bad situation. On the right side is God's remedy or God's encouragement. And so here, even in verse 17, but beloved, remember, now what had just gone before, he's talking about murmurs, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. But beloved, just remember, this is what he is saying. Remember the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How that they told you. He told you they were going to come. Told you that they would be there. And so here's who they are. They are those that, uh, that separate themselves. That is, they distinguish themselves. They make themselves to be something special. And this is one of the things, unfortunately, many of those are going under the guise of gospel preachers. And it's more about them. Hey, look at me. Look at what a wonderful job I'm doing. Look at what a great preacher I am. Look what a great orator I am. Look at all of these things. And what they have to say is very shallow and definitely very much lacking in substance. Now, if they're telling the truth, I'm all for them. And they don't have to be Baptist. That's not what I'm talking about here. This is not a sectarian issue. This is about God's truth. And this, the scripture warns concerning those. But then here comes the but again. Verse 20. But ye, beloved, you're going to do something different. You're going to act in a different fashion. But you, beloved, building up yourselves, on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Now, I want to give you some words here. Call your attention to them, and then I'm going to zero in on just a few. But first of all, as you would look at this thing, but ye beloved, what's the first instruction or the exhortation? Building. Building up yourselves on your most holy faith. What's the second thing? Praying. In the the Holy Spirit. What's the third thing? Keeping yourselves in the love of God. What's the fourth thing? Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And then he gives some things concerning others, concerning compassion, concerning the ungodly, concerning an evangelistic purpose. And of some have compassion, making a difference. Others Become desperate about it. And this is why, as you can see, there's such a scope of material that's contained here that I hesitate to even attempt to do something like that in one brief message. But, and so he saved them with fear. And then just gives a most precious benediction here as the one that's able to keep you from falling. So what does he say, first of all? building up yourself, and in verse 21, it's keep yourselves. And then in verse um, 24, unto him that is able to keep you from falling. And so you are keeping and you are kept. That's what we are to be about. And so as we look at this passage of Scripture, and in particular this evening, I want to deal with, but ye beloved, And there's that. I'm going to keep that but out in the presence of these things. But ye, beloved, what are you going to do? Build yourselves on the most holy faith, on your 
most holy faith. And so the, the our topic here is the words of encouragement from Jude, and in particular, building up on the foundation of the faith that's once delivered to all to the saints. Once and for all, the emphasis is made there in the first part of this epistle. And when we're talking about faith, we want to understand two things. Number one is not talking about the ability to believe, and I may say more about that in a moment, but he is talking about what you believe. What is the basis of your faith? He's talking about a foundation here, building on, and thus to consider this even in a devotional content. And sometimes I've seen people, well, I heard one man make a statement one time about a particular commentator. said, well, he's a devotional commentator. He's not very deep. And I thought to myself, wait a minute, there's nothing deeper than experiencing true devotion toward God. And if somebody can stir that in me, then I, I'm in. Conclude me in. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go. And so with that thought in mind, we would look to these things not only in terms of what we believe, but then to be suitably affected by those things, promoting devotion toward God and, I dare say, devotion toward one another. And so many of the directives in Scripture aim at the individual believer, while some are intended to be understood and applied to individuals as a group and as a church in particular. So when Jude is writing here, he might be saying to me, and you, Brant, you build yourself up. But he could also be saying, and you, family, you, church, you build yourself up as individuals with that common aim, possessing that common salvation in Jesus Christ to be built up on those truths, on those things that are most assuredly true about him. And so the things spoken of here in the beginning of this passage and in the end of this letter addresses things that involve individual behaviors that apply to and benefit of a group. So as I would speak here this evening, you listening as a person, then it's to you. And then as I think in terms, as your thoughts go out, reach out to your brothers and sisters in Christ, to those to whom God has called you together to serve among and to serve with, and I emphasize that word serve, that it might be heard by all. So we begin thus and have begun with that apostolic instruction to seek to develop fully as the servants of our Lord that we might be used to his glory and to our delight. So he said, you beloved, considered with affection from Jude as loved of the Lord, you who are loved, understand it, be encouraged. This is one of the things that I think sometimes we lose sight of about the time that, oh, woe is me and the sad and glum feeling about yourself. You just kind of forget yourself. You forget somebody loves you. You say, yeah, I know my mommy loves me. No, the God of the universe, the God of creation, the eternal God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ has loved you from all eternity. And so love to the Lord. Again, it's to be understood that it comes out to all of us, but it's a term often used when expressing concern for safety and for well-being. And so for that reason, John would write, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. And so it is to build yourselves up on that. Paul would write in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. 
but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. I know that many grab this passage and start talking about church planting and this type of thing, but Paul makes it clear what the foundation is that he's laid. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is Jesus Christ. He goes on in that same context, and this is the thought to build up on this and take heed what you build there on, what you attach to it, whom you attach to it, what you teach the people that you attach or that you erect on this foundation. And to where he says in, in 1 Corinthians 3, 11 and 12, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And then the warning is, if anybody's building on that foundation, garbage, be careful. That's what we're to be concerned about. Christ as the foundation. And and so it's not the mere mention of the name. It is Christ in the gospel. And who is the gospel? Moreover, brethren, Paul wrote to the Corinthians later, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand. You're anchored on that. You build on that. You're built on that and by which also ye are saved. You experience salvation as you keep in memory what I preached unto you unless you believed in vain. Was there something to what you believed? Oh, it's still there. And if, if, you, if you have, if not, you don't have anything. That which may be built and understood and erected among God's people Build your character. Identify with the Lord Jesus Christ. Build your confidence. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And I'm going to expand on that because I really believe that this was what Paul was saying to the Philippian jailer. When he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be being saved. It is a continuous work. It is an ongoing thing. You're in the state of saved salvation. And thus we're built up on that. We can be built up in ability, doing those things which he has ordained of God. The Built up in the true worship of God. Many other things that pertain to the life of the believer and his relationship to God in Christ. But above all of this, we must understand that it is on that most holy faith what is believed. And these things I would have you to know, it is centered in Christ. It is the Word of God. It is concerning the work of redemption that required the vindication of His holiness. Peter described us as together being this, a holy priesthood and a holy nation. And so the exhortation is, be ye holy. Faith enables to do that and looks to just that. And that's why the writer here, this is why Jude expresses it in this way, your most holy faith. It is that which is received in the gospel, given that upon which we are built, that which portrays eternal life as a possession on which we are to lay hold. Now, I've covered a lot of territory here, and it may be in the next few weeks, and I'm not sure just how long we'll be doing this, but I suspect it may be for a few more weeks, but we may come back to some of these thoughts and we'll proceed on to others because there is so much here about praying in the Holy Spirit. What is it? What is it? And then keeping yourselves in the love of Christ, keeping yourselves in that way of being loved of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, my friend, there is no other means. We are built upon that foundation which cannot be shaken. And that is Christ Jesus himself. That's the essence. That's the content He is the gospel. He is the good news. And if you don't know him this evening, I certainly point you to him that you would fall upon his mercy, 
because it is only in what he has accomplished in suffering and dying, not only under the sinful hand of man, but under the wrath of God, in order that he might rise again with new life in Jesus Christ. And so I bid you, fall upon his mercy, look to him. There is salvation in no other, none other name, given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. Father, we thank you for this privilege of opening your word. Pray that you would bless it to all that hear it, and that above all else, that they might glorify thee as the one true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent, and in whose name I pray, and amen.